Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the fourth in a series of videos where I'm looking at Super Collider, a programming language for music, and in particular, an emulation of the Buchla 700 synthesizer, or at least my rough interpretation of what this architecture might be. I've made a couple of patches here, some bass patches based on various famous DX series patches. That one's actually based on the, the Synclavier gong that's used in the start of Beat It. Obviously, this does not sound like that, but it's as close as I could get and still fun. Cheesy electric piano. Something to try out various stuff. And so you can have a lot of fun with the patches I have in here. Just by switching the configuration, as Buchla calls it, that's equivalent to the DX series algorithms you'll find in the Yamaha instruments. Anyway, in the first part of the series, I went over the overall structure, in particular the initialization code. In the second part, we looked at the synth def that actually defines the synthesis code itself. This code is special in that it runs on the Super Collider server. The other code in here runs on the Super Collider client that does things like actually start notes on the server. And the client and the server is a distinction that can exist just within your laptop or whatever. It's not like the server is sitting on a machine on the cloud or something like that. It's just the way Super Collider divvies up the work. And it's important to keep track of that, particularly because there's functionality available on the client side that doesn't work on the server side. The synth def is sort of defining a structure in this code as much as it's defining an algorithm per se. So in the third part, we looked at the actual MIDI handling code that starts notes. And here in the fourth and final part, we're going to look at the code that creates the GUI. And there's my fancy GUI. So I would recommend watching the other videos in the series if you haven't already, but a good portion of the discussion here will be more or less self-contained. I may repeat myself from some of the other videos when I discuss various super collider features. And if you're just interested in knowing how to create GUIs in Super Collider, this probably will work as a standalone discussion. Super Collider, to my knowledge, doesn't have any drag and drop fancy functionality like that for creating GUIs. So this was all created the old fashioned way by putting in pixel values in the code and then changing those around to move stuff around as necessary to try to get something that all fits together well. All right, so the main code for creating the GUI and also updating the GUI is this update GUI function. So functions in Super Collider are defined with open and closed brackets. Open and closed brackets do not define just sort of generic chunks of code like in an if-then statement in a language like C or C-sharp or whatever. These have a very distinctive use for defining functions. They're equivalent to the open and close close brackets in the programming language Smalltalk, which Super Collider borrows from pretty heavily in terms of its thought process. So this creates a function in this bracket block, and then we're assigning that to this variable. So there's not really a special syntax for defining functions. Functions in Super Collider are what computer science people would call first class. So the tilde here indicates that this is a global variable. And I define it here. So this doesn't actually run when I define it. But then later on in the code, do 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 after I define it, ah, so here's the end of that function, definition of that giant GUI creation function. 
And to be clear, this is probably terrible super collider coding practice and terrible programming practice in general. I just wanted to get stuff going. Anyway, here I have the function. Now, this is part of the big block of the code that executes. So when I execute this big block of the entire code, that's indicated by the close paren here and the open paren. So that's the entire file. So when I use cloverleaf return or this menu option, it executes everything in that block and sets things going. And then after I define that function, I call it and I call it using dot value. So whoops. So dot value sends a message to that function to execute itself. And I don't have to put any parameters in here because it's not a function that takes any parameters. All right. So let's see all of the crazy stuff that's inside this GUI function. So the first thing I do here is I load in an array of images associated with the various configurations. So array.fill12 creates an array with 12 elements, and then it runs this function. And here, this is a function that takes an argument i. And what array.fill will do is it will execute that function on the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 12. Actually, that reminds me, you can download my source code. I'm not very good necessarily about keeping this up to date. I'm just starting to learn to use GitHub and all that. Anyway, so the code you download from here may not match what I'm showing in the video, but you can get the code here. But actually somebody in one of the YouTube comments reminded me, I should add a note about this. You need to get the configuration images from Johan Boberg's webpage here. So if you go to the webpage shown here, randomvoltage.com slash 700, you can download these images and put those in the directory. All right. The other thing you'll need to change is that the image.new here, which snarfs the image, you'll want to change the path here to something appropriate for whatever's on your machine. So as you might guess, this plus plus concatenate strings. It takes the number here that's i, and that will be 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. And it sends a message to that number that's this as string to base by putting the width to argument to the function here i can make sure that for zero one two three i'll get zero 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 one zero two in the file name as appropriate add dot png so i snarf in all of those images oh this is something i have been meaning to mention for a while if you put a tilde in front of a variable name, that's a global variable, otherwise it's local variable, unless it's one character. So this seems like an odd design decision, but for A, B, C, D, you don't need to put that tilde in front if you want to have it be a global variable. I'm using W because that's what I've seen in a variety of tutorials, but I don't like the fact that this then doesn't get the nice syntax highlighting for a global variable that the editor knows how to do if you put a tilde in front of it. So when this routine is run, whatever window Super Collider happens to have open, I close all of those. I open up a window and set it to this W variable and Let's run the code and actually see that. So the title up here, B700-ish, is unsurprisingly in the string. I've set it so it can't be resized right here. This always on top, I never decided if I like that or not. So right now you can put code on top of it, which is very useful for this demonstration. But if I want, I could also set it always on top and it will then, okay, always be on top. That was something that probably did not require a lot of detailed explanation. Anyway, now I can look a little bit more. Notice before I have that code, I have a bit of code here. And what I do in this code is, as I'm working on the program, I'll often want to stick the window somewhere, change something, rerun it and try it. And I didn't want to have the window keep appearing in the same location each time because I wanted to move it around. So when I run it, I first see 
I ask, is W not nil? So I'm saying, you know, if there's something there or not. And basically, this winds up being such that this if-then statement is basically, um, let's see, what do I do here? Oh, okay. So there's actually two nested if and if then statements here. So if it's nil, then this if statement runs this false branch. So the way if statements work in super colliders, you have if condition, and then the true branch, and then the false branch like that. Now, what's interesting is the true branch here and the false branch, those need to be functions. Otherwise, it will actually execute this code. If isn't a special syntactical form, it's really just syntactic sugar. And I think most of the method calls in Super Collider work this way. We can take, if, if, if I say this if condition true branch, false branch, ah, sorry. What it's really doing is I have condition dot, and then I'm going to basically pass the if method to the condition and then I can give it the true branch and the false branch. Now, these need to be functions so that they're not automatically actually executed, which is why you see this wrapped in curly braces to make it a function, this wrapped in curly braces to make it a function, this whole thing wrapped in curly braces to make it a function, etc. So if the window is nil, meaning it's not been ever created at all, then I set the current bounds to a default location where I would like it to appear. Let's see that. Also, if I've created the window but it's closed, I'm not going to bother to try to figure out if, when, and where that happens, then it defines the, some standard bounds. Now, if there's a window that's not closed, I then catch that. So I ask the window, okay, well, what are your current bounds? Oh, those bounds are over here. So now when I run that again, I'm able to get the window in the whatever location I put it in. So that way it recreates the whole window, but it creates it in whatever spot I had left it. Let's see, this top part. Oh, I think this is compensation for how it counts the title bar or not. All right. So anyway, that's just setting up the window. Nothing exciting there. And then we set up all of our various things. So for instance, I'm creating a knob here. This is for a little crossfade between the output of wave shaper A and wave shaper B. This isn't part of the original Buco 700 and really in sort of my conception here isn't really part of a patch either. It's just really convenient. to hear the outputs of the two wave shapers independently. To get a sense for what each of them is doing. Oh, that one actually, that was not so interesting because it's not using either of the wave shapers really. Let's see, that one wouldn't be interesting. So that's the main body of the electric piano. Or actually, no, this would be considered the main body. And that's the tinny tine part. Oh, I have all sorts of weirdness going on there. Let's just move on to the tubular bells. So those are very similar sounds. I just have them detune slightly from each other. Okay, so let's uh, go back and look at that window routine. Let's find the knob. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this creates a knob, assigns it to the object. So it's creating the knob on this window W. This rect is telling us where to put the knob. And then here I have a set of methods that I send to this knob object. One of these is action underscore. And I think, if I remember right, there's different ways to handle this. I think you could probably do something like once I define the knob, I could do CF knob dot action, whatever. I would have to go back and think, or actually, no, I think you can, 
Oh, if I remember right, if it's this underscore here, it means it's a variable. It sort of acts like a variable that you can set. I would have to go look that up again. I may not be remembering that correctly. Anyway, so you might, as you might have guessed, this is not as tightly edited as sort of my main lecture videos for my classes and stuff like that. This is just a side project. Sorry, I don't have a lot of time to edit these. Anyway, so there's a couple of things we set up here. One is the value of the knob. So GCF is the value of this crossfade variable that's actually used in the code. So that's set to some default value or or it's been set by choosing some particular patch. I actually have this set at halfway on all of these. Again, this is something I mostly use for diagnostics and wasn't really thinking of as part of the patch, although it's stored as part of a patch if you want to do that. Anyway, so when we use dot value, it changes the knob to whatever that value is. So that makes sure that the knob here that you're seeing is updated with whatever the appropriate value is when it's created. Let's see. So if I try CF knob, let's see if I set this to zero. No, no, no. Sorry. I'll need to do value, value equal. How about let's do one. Ah, see, it changed there. If I do 0 0.25, it changed appropriately. And let's see, because I think this is syntactic sugar for this thing with the underscore. underscore. Let's try that. Ah, yeah, okay. So that, that is what's going on there. I had that right. Let's see. The action here, that's another important thing. This action, you give it a function. And what that function does is it's a callback that executes when somebody twiddles the GUI. So when somebody does something like this, do 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 this action gets run. And let's see, what do we do in this function here? So I have notes, notes.do. So I have a, I use notes.do a lot. Okay. Ah, right. Notes are the individual synths that are created and run each time I play a note. This is where all the real stuff happens in here. So when I go back to, let's go around here, the notes.do, let's see. So here I set the GCF to whatever the value is that we set the knob to. So down here I was setting the way it looks like in the GUI to whatever the appropriate variable is. Here I'm setting that variable, I'm setting it to whatever we set in the GUI. And then the next thing we check is to see if that synth that might be assigned to this note is actually still playing, because if it is, we want to update that variable inside the synth. So this slash CF that corresponds to Let's see, the running code I think is up here. Ah, it corresponds to this kind of CF when we call to create that synth. And that corresponds to the actual, say, CF variable up here in the argument here in the synth def. So if we go back and look at the knob routine, I think that covers all of that. And a lot of the rest of the things here fit that similar kind of structure. Let's see, static text. Okay, this frequency ratios is created by this line. Nothing too terribly surprising there. Similar to the knobs, I create a series of text boxes for the numerators and the denominators. So these are basically the same code with just different variables. If I was trying to make this a more elegant, piece of code, I would probably abstract this out in some way. There's a lot of cut and paste style programming here, which is, of course, a quote unquote code smell indicating you would want to probably do something better. Anyway, I create for the numerators and the denominators an array of four boxes. 
let's see. So we have text fields. Those, these are the things that I set here. So again, I have a function that's a callback that runs when somebody changes something in one of these boxes. Whatever it is. And when that's called and I change this number, let's see what we do. Ah, I get the value from the text box, which is a string. So I turn it into a floating point number. Now, if it's not equal to zero, then I update the information and the variables in the actual running code. So that's what sets the new variable. But notice I have this not equal to zero thing because basically if you type garbage in here of any sort, it returns zero. And then in that case, what does it do? Oh, I have it take whatever the current value of that parameter is, that numerator value, turn it into a string and shove it back into the value. So that's why if I type garbage, that evaluates to zero and then it resets it back to whatever it was before I tried changing it. And it only makes that change if it's a legit number. Let's see, if I put in minus five, what happens? Okay, I can put in negative numbers, that could be fun. Anyway, what if I put in zero? Okay, it doesn't like zero because of the way I have this structured. So it updates things in here, but only if it's a legitimate value and if it's part of a plain synthesized note. So this is what lets you change the thing in the middle of a note, which is kind of cool. Let's see if I can... So I didn't key a new note there. It was able to say, oh, there's a synth that's playing, so I should go ahead and update it while it's still sounding, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, so this is what happens when you change it. To initialize it, I have this tf string, tf dot string here. So this takes the text field and then sets it appropriately. Notice that I need to return the text field that I've created because this is part of this array.fill procedure. Let's see, the denominator boxes are basically the same. Let's see what kind of functions we're drawing in here. Oh, this is fun. This draw function, this is where we draw the configuration image. Oh, this took me forever. You can't just draw the image and change it. If you want it to actually show up, you have to do this w dot refresh thing. So there you go. So this draws an image at a particular location. The image itself isn't an object that you can then manipulate. This is just sort of raw splatting bitmaps in a spot. Let's see, I make some more text for the config. Ah, the config select, this is a drop down box that lets us select different things. Let's see how that is set up. Okay, it's a pop-down menu, not pop-down menu, pop-up menu. It's gonna have a series of items and uh, its current value is whatever the current configuration is. So that's something that gets set here appropriately. All right, so it's the action. So before we get to the action, this is part of the initialization routine. So if you load in a patch, that gconfig variable gets set and gets assigned to the value here. So it gets the appropriate number here. This array series 12, let's see what that does. Let me make sure I understand what that does. I'm going to use cloverleaf p to pull up this general menu. Ah, right. This dot series 12 just returned 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera. And that's what I use to set up the pop-up menu here. So we get the 0 through 12. So the action, 
that we have here. That's what happens if you pick one of these options. So when you pick something here, it will change the configuration variable to whatever the value you picked, reading that from this particular object. And it will then run that drawing routine to draw the appropriate configuration image. So the one up here, this is run when you either start the program or you load in a new patch. This is what can run and update the image here while a patch is playing. Ah, and remember, you need this refresh. Here's that notes.do. This is where we can say, oh, if there is a patch playing, update appropriately. So this is how I'm able to take one of these patches. and change it while the patch is playing. All right, scrolling down a little bit more, we come to these buffers. So this is the setup that handles the various wave shapes that we have here. So let me pull up an initial boring patch. I can run it through different transfer functions. And remember, this is a wave shaper. So this isn't a cycle of a waveform that you're seeing. What I'm showing over here on the right is an example of what you would get out of this wave shaper if you put in a sine wave. And this is just for illust illustrative or illustrative. I guess it's, how would you pronounce that? Anyway. That's just an example. Of course, using the FM and timbre modulation, you could get much more complicated things going in. But this just gives you a sense of what's going on. So if you put in a sine wave through this transfer function, you get this output. And this is the setup that lets us do that. So as part of the setup routine, we can go in here and say, Okay, so the signature, uh, not signature, signal, this Shebby fill uses Shebyshev polynomials from the set of polynomials that, or I should say polynomial coefficients that we said earlier in the code. And that's up here, right. So I set up all of these possible transfer functions and of course you can add ones. And then if I go back down here to the code, this lets us set up actually filling the wavetable. So these are both functions that we execute further down in the code. And what it takes as an argument is a zero, one, two, three, four, five or whatever to pick the appropriate transfer function. And what do we do? We create the signal, and the signal here is that Shebyshev polynomial sequence that's actually realized as a transfer function table. And then it goes through this weird stuff to actually set this up. So we need to set this as wavetable no wrap, because otherwise it makes an assumption that you're going to use this as a cycle of a waveform that you're cycling through. And this buffer dot load sorry buffer dot load collection. This is a thing that needs to happen to actually take that data and put it from the client side over to the server side that actually makes the notes. Notice this doesn't change as a patch is playing because it's a bit more of a complicated operation, all of this loading in. So let's see what we have here. The inv title strings. Oh, that's from something else. Let's see. I still want to stick with talking about these buffers for a second. 
where do I do that? Ah, down here. So here I have the routines that are involved in selecting this. So when you select one of these, we run either the A plot routine or the B plot routine. So down here I've got, I have the wave shaper B. And notice these are basically the same except for the color of the plot and the location. Again, if I was trying to make nicer, more extensible code, would probably want to do something about this cut and space, sorry, cut and paste style and abstract this out a bit. So there's variables that indicate which of the, whoop, let me make sure we're listening to that. So these are numbers indicating which wave shape is selected. And here then we run these setup buffer routines. So those were set up here again. So these are functions. They have the open and close brackets that define a function. They take one argument selection. So we assign these functions to these variables. And so the way we call it is to call it by sending it the message value with the appropriate parameter. All right. So going back, let's see what we have here. Ah, the envelope routines. So this here is probably one of the most intricate and complicated pieces of the code. So I wanted to have the full flexibility of Super Collider's rich collection of envelope types available to the patch designer. And I decided to set this up so that you could just type bits of Super Collider code in here. And this is where that's set up. So the env titles, what are those? Ah, these are the strings. So this is IDX1, IDX2, IDX3, et cetera. That's a string set that I set up earlier in the code. So I just plunk those all down. Notice down here now, I set up a couple of colors. So number M's is the number of envelopes. That's just hard coded. Yeah, it's sloppy, whatever. Anyway, so here we're gonna create some text boxes and we're using that fill command to create the text boxes that we type the code to generate the envelopes in. And there's a lot of repetition here. There's also some repetition of this in some of the note running code that probably has more code than to actually necessary. There was a lot of copy and pasting, but I'm scared to change anything and break it. Anyway, what do we do here? So for each of these text fields that we're creating, we need to have a routine that says what happens when you change what's in this field. So the main thing that I do in here is that I actually try compiling the code. So this dot value, ah, no, sorry, it goes the other direction. So I take the object, which is whatever it is, dot value that pulls out the string, and then I compile it and that creates a compiled bit of code. And then I can't remember the details on it, but I have to do dot value to actually get, try running that piece of code. So we compile this piece of code, dot value says run that piece of code. And that's why I have this in this try error block. This allows me to trap mistakes. Notice an error is basically ignored. This try setup here allows me to not have sort of that piece of code crash out in a nasty way. It just kind of keeps going. In any case, I've initialized this variable to be nil. So if this doesn't nicely compile to an envelope, when I ask, hey, is this a kind of envelope? If it's not a valid envelope, I take the string here and I set it to red. 
So that gives us an error message and it lets us know that we need to go in and fix that. And if it does compile, well, then I can take that envelope and assign it appropriately. And here's where I change the color as needed. So I thought that was pretty slick. The reason I have this vel and nn, this corresponds to velocity and note number, is that I give you the option of using the note number or the, ah, here's where we're using velocity. I think I also use it in the piano. So to test this code to make sure it works, I have to assign some dummy values to the variable just to make sure it'll compile. Of course, when the actual synth is run, these are assigned to, to the appropriate values. All right, so whew, there's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of the things you'll see here, that looks like a replica of most of the code here. And the reason for that is that this is the code that's run when you change something in here. This is the code that I'm running when I'm either starting the program or loading in a new patch. So it still has to do all of those things. If I load in a new patch, it needs to check to make sure that the envelope is a real envelope and not garbage code. If it's garbage code, I set it to red, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you see sort of this copied structure. Again, it would probably be a good idea to clean this up and not have such obvious cut and paste code, but it seems to work for what, it works enough for what I need to do. All right, let's see what else I have in here. The offset sliders. Ah, so here I make some sliders, and these are generally not really part of the patch per se in theory. Let me get... That wasn't very impressive. Let's try something else. There we go. I love that. Anyway, sorry, I'm easily amused. It's also 5.30 in the morning. Why am I recording this at 5.30 in the morning? Anyway, I was just having an urge to get this done. All right. So I have these sliders, and these are generally thought of as performance controls on the 700. Usually, if you want to have something at a constant value, you really should put that in the envelope down here, and these are just kind of fun for experimentation. These are numbers that I add on top of whatever parameter is defined by the envelope. I'm just taking a guess that that is probably what's happening on the 700, but who knows? That's just a guess based on looking at some of Don Pukla's other instruments. All right. So like with the other controls, we're going to create this array of sliders. And there's one for each of these envelope types. And... Here we have the action, and that I give a function, which is what we want to have happen when it's changed. So the rest of the synth code I have sort of works with numbers, real numbers from 0 to 10. The sliders go from 0 to 1. So here I just multiply it by 10. I set the appropriate variable. And then if a note is playing, then I set the appropriate offset, sorry, then I set the appropriate offset at the particular appropriate value. Notice the set I in here, that's for if you want to set something that's an array. Anyway, all right. <laughs> uh, here I have different colors for the different sliders to try to match their functions in some way. And that's where I set the colors here with this dot knob color for the slider. Let's see, I've got, here I set up the text that goes, un, whoop, sorry. This is, I accidentally scrolled somewhere in the code that I didn't want to. 
Ah, here we go. Here's the sliders. All right. So down here, as part of my little sequence here, I have the text that we create that you see down here. And I look up the appropriate strings for the different titles down here. Let's see. What else do I have here? Oh, we talked about this earlier. This is where I make the plots if you pick different options down here for the wave shape functions. Here's where I actually run those routines to make the plots. So running them here, that's part of what happens if I start the program or load in a new patch. That's what's happening here when I do dot value, it executes that. The static text here, let's see, ah, Here's where I have my wave shape A and wave shape B. Here I set up the pop-up menus for wave shape A and wave shape B. And as you might expect, that's what lets us select the wave shape. The structure here isn't really a whole lot different than the other things we've looked at already, so I won't talk about that much further. Ah, so here's a fun one. Here's the drop-down menu for the patch data selection. And when I run that here in the action callback that runs when you pick one of these things, it actually runs this update GUI function. It basically just kind of clears everything out and redoes the whole thing. So if this was 1989 or something, right, slower processors, I would be a little less profligate probably and might only redraw the things that actually need redrawn. Okay, and then finally, we have these rows of buttons. Anyway, so I've set up all the MIDI stuff so that I can activate things from my MIDI controller or I can actually use these buttons. So the MIDI code that we looked at in part three ran these start note and stop note functions. And with the MIDI controller, I can have varying velocity. These pads here, I just set those to have velocity 127. And so we're creating a array of buttons here and I have row one row two and oh I have row two here that's interesting I meant to probably have that be row three but the code still works so something about me creating these buttons did not in fact like row two here is really row three but the fact that I signed it to row two did not make like row two vanish or disappear. So the buttons I'm creating here have a life, it seems, outside of the fact that I happen to assign it to a variable. So it looks like that's... Actually, what if I took that out altogether? Would this all still work? Yeah, it does. So I don't, I don't even really need to assign these to variables, although... For future expansion, that might be handy. Huh, that's interesting. Anyway, so nothing too surprising here. There's different callbacks for things you can do based with the mouse. I had to, oh, the leave action. It took a while to figure out the exact callbacks to use here so that when I took the cursor off the note, it kept playing, but only really stopped playing when I let go of the mouse button. Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. So we've been through all of the code in these four parts. Sorry, these are not as polished and edited as some of my other material. I hope it was still useful to you and still fun.